In this verse is the first comment that God made about humanity. The first comment that God made about humanity is recorded in Genesis 2.18 and it simply says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. It is not good that man should be alone. What's interesting is to do a word study of this word alone in the Hebrew. In actual fact, the transliteration of the Hebrew letters into English spells B-A-D, bad. And uh, it's bad. And this word uh, in, in the Hebrew literally gives you a picture of a branch cut off a tree. It's not good that you should be cut off from a tree. It's not good that you should be separated. It's not good that you should be isolated. It's not good that you should be solitary. It's so important that we understand that God created us as social beings. We have been created by God to be together. And so obviously we, we read the, ver- the rest of the verse and God created for Adam his, uh, his spouse Eve. But so often we only read this verse and interpret it. It's not good that man should be single. That's not what this is saying. It's not, it's not good that man should be unmarried. That's not what this is saying. It's saying it's not good that man should be isolated, alone by themselves. It's got nothing to do with marriage. It's got everything to do with community. God created us as social beings. And and what you see in the Bible is community. What you see right throughout the Bible is the importance of community. Jesus was in community wherever he went. He had his 12 disciples around him. And besides the 12 disciples, there were others. There were 70. There was community wherever Jesus went. You say, but, but didn't Jesus go to a solitary pl- place to pray? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with your moments of, 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 uh, of prayerfulness and, and being solitary. There's nothing wrong with that. And especially if you're an introvert, you need some of that. And it's important that you do that, but you don't live there. You don't remain there. You do that, you get energized, and then you go back into community. What you find when you read the New Testament is the whole New Testament church were always in community. They went from house to house, breaking bread. There was this whole sense of community. Uh, Psychologists all declare. Whenever you read anything on psychology, what you find is that all psychologists, all psychiatrists, and Bev beautifully said it today, you know, I'm worried about you. And when John communicated, no, I'm in community. I'm I'm surrounded by people. He says, now I know that you're healthy. They all declare, psychologists all declare that you need to be in community to have good mental health. Isolation creates bad mental health. Matter of fact, let me just emphatically state point number two isolation is unhealthy proverbs chapter 18 verse 1 says this a person a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and then he says he rages or she rages against all wise judgment isolation is unhealthy and can i just say that If you isolate yourself, you've actually made excuses for it. Here's some of the excuses for isolation. Okay, I've worked really hard and I'm too tired to go to Connect Group. I'm too tired to go to church. I'm too tired to talk to people. Can I just say, it's an excuse for your isolation. Here's another excuse. I'm too busy. I'm too busy running around. I'm too busy making a living. I'm too busy doing this. I'm too busy doing that. I'm too busy. Let me tell you something. If you're too busy to have friends, you are way too busy, baby. And let me tell you something as well. Is that your priorities declare where you put your time. And so if you're too busy for community, you're too busy for friendships, Can I just declare to you, you've made the wrong priorities in life. You've got to lift community. You've got to lift 
friendships way above whatever it is that you've made a priority in your life. Here's another one. Excuse for isolation. I've been hurt by people. I've been hurt. You know what my answer to that is? Join the club. Who hasn't been hurt by people? Huh? This is part of life. You get hurt by the people that you love the most. You think about the people that you love the most. How many of you are married? Okay. I don't have to say anymore. But what do you do? You deal with it. You resolve it. Why is that? Because we are all imperfect, starting with your pastor. He's the first one to put up his hand and say, I'm the most imperfect of pastors. But you know what? We work it out. We work it out. I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect pastor. I'm not a perfect son. I'm not a perfect brother. I'm not a perfect anything. But you know what? We just got to work it out. You know why? Because the enemy wants to separate you from strategic relationships. And you've got to see sometimes the fingerprint of the enemy trying to isolate you, trying to separate, especially strategic relationships that God has brought together. And what happens sometimes is that, is that the enemy just brings stuff up. And divides you from strategic relationships. I've seen people separated from church, separated from strategic relationships, and their whole lives goes downhill because the enemy is one. And you know what the excuse is? I've been hurt. I've been hurt. So my, my response to that is resolve your hurt because the enemy is wanting to divide you. So, so um, here's, here's another one. Here's another excuse. It's not convenient. You know, uh, you know, I've got other things and it's not convenient. Well, as I said before, you've got to make it convenient. You've got to prioritize. And your convenience is connected to your priorities. Can I also say that escapism can replace community? And you've got to be careful that you don't get involved in a world of escapism. And, and, and I can say so much about this, but we've got a whole society that escapes from community. Can I just say Facebook is not community. Social media is not community. And it becomes escapism. Escapism can, uh, you know, and, and, you know, hobbies are good. I've got no issues with hobbies, but some hobbies can become compulsive. And so you just, you, you just live in your hobby and you isolate yourself through a hobby. And another escapism is fantasy worlds that people get involved in. Can I just say television can become a fantasy world and an escapism and, and it becomes something where you just, you know, I'm not saying don't watch television, but I'm just saying be careful that television doesn't become escapism. Gaming. My, can I just say to you parents with teenagers, uh, the dopamine that happens through gaming can actually isolate them and it can become a world of escapism. Pornography is another world of escapism. And can I just say to men, if you're involved in pornography, the enemy will use pornography to isolate you and you're searching your pornography and isolating yourself from community and cutting you off and you become a target for the enemy. Which, which, which brings me to point number three, that isolation draws you into the enemy's trap. There's a trap that the enemy draws you into and isolates you. Deuteronomy 25 verse 18. Such an important scripture regarding Amalek and, and God punished Amalek. But Amalek's strategy for the children of Israel was that he attacked their rear ranks. All the stragglers, those at the rear when they were tired and weary. And so what the enemy, I mean, how many of you have seen documentaries of lions looking for a meal? And they'll go to, to you, you see this, 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 field of gazelles and the and the lion does not go into the center to find a gazelle in the center he's looking for someone at the rear he's looking for someone who is isolated he's looking for someone who is weary and tired and that's who he pounces on and can i just say to you that your isolation actually causes you to fall into the trap of the enemy the bible says in first 
Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. He's seeking for the isolated. He's seeking for those that have separated themselves because they've made excuses. I'm too tight. I'm too weary. I'm too busy. I'm too hurt. It's not convenient. You've isolated yourself. You're at the rear ranks. Yeah, I'll just go to church once on a Sunday, go home, but I don't have to talk to people. I don't have to connect. I don't have to answer the question, are you okay? What's going on in your life. Can you see what I'm talking about? And the other thing that happens is that no accountability. When you isolate yourself, you're unaccountable to anybody. And I want to say to you that one of the greatest gifts that you can ever receive from a friend is accountability. Someone that asks you the question, what's going on in your life? No judgment. But just with a helping hand, I'm here to help you. I'm struggling with this. I'm so glad you shared that. Can we help you? I'm struggling with my marriage. I'm struggling with my finances. I'm struggling with my sexuality. I'm struggling with this, that, and the other. This is the beautiful thing about community is that accountability is there not to constrain you, but to protect you. The gift of accountability. Here it is. I'm going to finish with this. We need one another. I want you to put your hand on your heart. And I want you to say this. I need people. And people need me. I want us to say it again. I need people. And people need me. Let's not forget the second part. We need others and others need us. Jesus defined discipleship in John chapter 13, verse 35. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. There is just something so, so beautiful about doing life with people. There is just something so beautiful about being surrounded. There is something so beautiful of when you're tired and weak, there's someone by your side to lift you up. There's something so beautiful about that, but you've got to invest in that to receive that. Can I just say it's impossible to fulfill God's commands outside a community. There are 59 separate commands that cannot be done outside a community. The love one another, that's that's. That's commanded at least 16 times in the Bible. Be devoted to one another, honour one another, live in harmony with one another, build up one another, be like-minded towards one another, accept one another. And the list goes on and on and on. 59 separate commands that is impossible to fulfil outside a community. You say, but I come to church. Church is a celebration. I love the fact that this morning you're sitting there and you're listening and we're communicating But you know what? You can come out, you can leave, and nobody knows what's going on in your life. And as a church, we do want to do celebration, but we don't want to make that the end of it. And so we try to establish community here. And and one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to enlarge within this, this, this little space. We're trying to... And so one of the things that we'll be doing in our refurbishment is that we're actually going to put another coffee area in that outside foyer so that people can have more room to fellowship after church. Do you know, we, we designed this church 21 years ago and, and if I had to do it again, I would actually try to make the fellowship space the size of our auditorium. That's, that's what I, you know, if, if, if someone said, if you had to redesign the church, what would you do? I'd say, I want the fellowship space, the size of the auditorium. Why is that? So that people don't just come and leave, but they can hang around and build community. Yeah. So not just on Sundays, but what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? You know, and we got Vision Sunday coming up in a couple of weeks' time. And one of the things that, we, that we're really pushing this year is how to do community better. And so especially with the men. And so we're going to be establishing a men's connect on a Monday night so that men can connect. I see it as probably one of the greatest weaknesses that we have is men connecting and having a place where they can talk, where they can open up, where they can listen 
and um, and 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 that's that's happening this year. We've on the fifteenth, we've got uh, a men's event happening at the church. Lindsay Clark is coming to speak at that. I spoke to him this week. He's coming to speak at that. But we're trying to get men to connect. And ladies, can I just say one of the greatest gifts you can get your husband is to force him to go to a connect group. Just get them along by hook or by crook. Just get them along because they need it. I've seen too many men isolate themselves, not talk and just become islands, get busy in their hobbies, just go off and ride motorbikes by themselves because they don't need fellowship. But longing in their heart, there's this emptiness because every man needs a mate, a mate that will stand with them, a mate that will listen, a mate that won't just make judgments, but a mate that says... I'm going to be here with you and be here for you and love you regardless. Everyone needs that. Everyone. You know, can I just say to you, if you're not in a connect group, you're the one that's missing out. This is not forcing anything. This is saying, we want to bless you. We want to create a community here that's real, that's authentic, that loves God and loves each other authentically, non-judgmental just fully loving and full of advice to help you do life better. Come on, I just want to finish this morning. My my time is up and I've got so much more to say. But you know what? We're going to be here next week. And we're going to do part two on this next week. And Anne's got some more testimonies and some more interviews to do. And I've got some more Bible to teach you on. And it's going to be great. But just come next week. Invite your friends. But I want to finish today by saying this. The most beautiful thing that you can do is to become part of the family of God. The family of God. This is the eternal family. You can't beat this. When I look around and I see the 70 different nationalities that we have in this house. But we're all family. And I say this constantly. We might have 70 nationalities in our house, but we've only got one family. And that's the family of God. I love this family of God so closely knitted into one. And in John chapter 1, verse 12, basically this is what this says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Can I say that the Bible is emphatic. If you want to be part of the family of God, you have to receive Jesus. And it's so easy. It's not difficult. Children can do it. And just simply say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. You know, this week I had the privilege on Friday to go and pray for my auntie who's just on her deathbed. And and I just felt the Holy Spirit say, go and pray for her today on Friday. I was going to go on Monday, but I felt the Holy Spirit say, go Friday. And so when I arrived on Friday, her body is starting to shut down. And so, and so I said to the family, look, I've come to pray for her. And they said, no, no. Um, she can't hear a word that you're saying. Her, the body is shutting down and she's deaf. Last night, she stopped hearing and she can't hear anything. I, I, I was so disappointed because I wanted to pray for her and her to say amen. And then, and then I said to her, Auntie, can you hear me? Can you hear me? She says, and, and you know, she pointed to ears. She couldn't hear me. And then, and then she said to her son, she said, Get some cotton buds and, get, and put some oil in my ears. So we got some cotton buds and, and just put some oil in the heat. And, and then all of a sudden she could hear. And so I said, can you hear me? She says, yes, I can hear you. I says, I've come to pray for you so that you can be sure that you'll spend eternity with Jesus. Would you like me to pray for you? She said, yes, I would love you to pray for me. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you. And if you agree with me, I either want you to say amen or squeeze my hand. She said, yes. And so I started to pray this very simple prayer with her. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. She said, amen. And she squeezed my hand. 
I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. She said, amen, and she squeezed my hand. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour. Amen. Jesus, please forgive my sins. Amen. Please help me to forgive every person who has sinned against me. Amen. Jesus, I want to live with you forever. Amen. 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 Simple prayer. I'm bawling like a baby. My mother was stand, sitting right next to her. She's bawling like a baby. The presence of God was in the room. Today, why don't you make it your opportunity to invite Jesus in your heart and just pray that simple prayer.